Hi everybody, this is your fellow fan of pop culture, Steve Ludwig, welcoming you to another edition of Steve Ludwig's Classic Pop Culture, right here at PlanetLudwig.com. In December of 2014, I had the opportunity to interview one of my music heroes, the king of the surf guitar, Dick Dale. Many of us know of Dick's song, Miserloo, which was featured in the Pulp Fiction soundtrack. As you'll hear and see in the next hour, Dick Dale was wonderfully outspoken, an animal preservation activist, and very zen. Now this is a brand new 2023 re-edit of our interview with tons of newly added Dick Dale images. Dick's wife, Lana, was instrumental in making this interview happen. Now, a little over four years after this interview, Dick succumbed to his many health problems. After listening to the interview, please rock on to the Dick Dale set I put together, which will, you will find at the PlanetLudwig.com website. As far as the interview goes, I was nervous. Dick Dale was brilliant. Rest in peace, Dick Dale. Thanks for everything. Enjoy the interview, everyone. In 2009, he was inducted into the Musicians Hall of Fame in Nashville, Tennessee. In 2011, inducted into the Surfing Walk of Fame in Huntington Beach, California. And Cleveland's Rock and Roll Hall of Fame better get their act together because it's long overdue. His style has been credited with influencing, among others, Jimi Hendrix and Eddie Van Halen. Guitar, mag guitar Player Magazine is called Dick Dale, the Father of Heavy Metal. He's a Grammy nominee. His song, Let's Go Trippin', is regarded as the first surf rock song. He is the undisputed king of surf guitar. What an honor and a privilege to welcome to the show, Mr. Dick Dale. Dick, welcome to the show. Three, two, one. Mr. Dale, you're on. Hello. <laughs> welcome to the show. I'm going to tell you right now, I love you, Dick Dale, and I love your music. I got to tell you right now, I have a sarcastic sense of Bostonian humor. Well, I got to tell you right now, I'm from New Jersey and I like the Yankees. So, but other than that, I love you. Hey, from Jersey. <laughs> I, used, I I used to play in Wildwood, New Jersey, but in the days of my God, the Tops, the Four Tops, uh, 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 Fats Domino. Oh uh, boy! All the well, guys, but I'll play all around each other, like. In the, like the Rainbow Club, stuff like that, and the Four Tops and all that. Uh, it was such a fun time because on our breaks, we would go over to the corner and see uh, one of our favorites performing there at the same time. Like Fast would come in and say, "See me play," I'd go over, go over and watch him play. And then, and then what was so cool, I was doing some blues stuff on my guitar. That said to me, he said, Dick Dale, you got black blood in you, boy. <laughs> <laughs> and, I, and it was so cool because, you know, in those days, everybody was taking for their, their personality within themselves, you know, mm -hmm. not, not the color. It was yeah, the, uh, that's your, the soul, your soul, what you did. B.B. King, I played with B.B. 
Um, you know, so many of these different people, and it was wonderful. Yeah, and you know, Dick, my wife and I, about oh, maybe 10 years ago, speaking of B.B. King, we saw you play at B.B. King's in New York City. Yeah, maybe- I, I had fun playing there, too. And B.B. BB and I did a show in Long Beach at the uh, the huge, uh, where, where they were keeping the uh, Howard Hughes uh, Goose Goose. Mm. That, was, that was a fun thing. My brain, my capacities doesn't remember 30 seconds ago because of the diabetes and all that crap and the renal failure that I got and all the cancer we've been dealing with. But um, my mind does remember certain things that just pops up, you know. Mm-hmm. And, and uh, I tried to get those those pills to keep your mind thinking really good, but I can't remember where I put the bottle. <laughs> <laughs> you know, you know, but seriously, Dick. Before we go on, uh, can we talk? How is your health? I know you you've had uh, actually a second battle with rec- uh, rectal cancer. Uh, when I was in my twenties, I was given three three months to live, and then I I went through that. And be, see, I've never had a drug in my body. Mm-hmm. I've never put alcohol in my body. I don't smoke. I don't eat red meat, and. So that's given me the strength to, to deal with all these things that perk up. Twenty years ago, they told Lana I was not going to be alive. Mm. And uh, this is the second onslaught. And they told me not to get on stage because uh, mistakes were made during... Op- I had three operations, two of them being nine and a half hours long. My goodness. I, I, I What I do is, when we go on tour, relate this all the people who are going through the same type of things and then they see me on stage without taking pain pills, without taking drugs without doing these things and it makes them think different about their own way of thinking they like, geez if Dick Dale can do that I better get, out, get my butt out of bed and my body they told me if I get on that stage I will have uh, fistulas opening up that came from the radiation that I took and the chemotherapy that I took. I have to, I gotta raise $3,000 a month just to pay for my attachments on my stoma, my stomach. Oh my and, goodness. which I have two insurance companies. I've got Blue Cross, I gotta back up, and yet it won't cover that extra $3,000 so that I can stay alive keeping uh, my stoma uh, clean from infection. Mm. You have to change it every day. You don't change it once a week. And these poor people who are laying in bed that don't have the money or cannot force themselves to get up and work to raise that extra money that they need to fight the infections that they have, they, they're, they're, they're just lying there. They do come to my concerts. I've had them come in gurneys. I've had them come in wheelchairs and everything else. My wife is, is a nurse going on 40 years, and she comes home, and, and she'll see what appears to be a little freckle on my arm. She says, you're getting that looked at. I said, so, it's only a, you know, it's only a, no, no, oh, you're no. getting it worse. But you can never be too careful, isn't that? Don't That's you agree? Right. That's right. And, you know, uh, uh, I'll just end it with this part, that um, the, I, I, I was, I collapsed and I was on a gurney for 12 hours. Now, a gurney is not the most comfortable thing to be on. Mm-hmm. I was on a gurney for 12 hours with five doctors all around, surgeons and everything, and nobody could figure out why. And then Lana walks in. She was by my side. She saw through the window, and she said, May I see your screen? And they let her see the screen, and, he, and she said, Gentlemen, the three fistulas. One, two, three. Do you see them? Ay, ay, ay. And they went, Oh, my God. Oh, my God. Get the chopper. We're going to lose them. We're going to lose them. Get them into Palm Springs right away. It's because they were so busy trying to look for something else. Mm-hmm. Lana saw it. The minute she looked at the screen, and a fistula is a hole created by the radiation that you're taking, and my body was leaking for the last two years, and it destroyed my bladder, it destroyed, it stopped my kidneys, and and I've been wearing a bag. I was wearing a bag for two and a half years. 
Oh my lord! And I was catheterizing myself for two and a half years, and then I just ripped all that stuff out of there. I do have a bag now, I, you know, for my stoma, which is my intestine that sticks mm -hmm. out of my. But he was the one who saved my life there, and I could go on and on and on. But I'm not going to. But but when I say go on and on and on, it, it's a way of communicating with everybody out there that is going through the same thing and they're so doggone confused because they're not getting the proper help. I, I mean, I talk about what I've been through and, and that way, you know, I don't hide it. You know, I just, I share it. Mm -hmm. Because somebody come up to me and said, geez, I just had my skull cut open and they operated on the top of my skull inside me. And all these things that the people just open up to me and, and tell me, what's been going because they see me on the stage and I'm not ashamed of it mm -hmm. um, I, I make jokes of it yeah. uh, I swear at it in my own Bostonian language get out, <laughs> you know, get out of my effing body and, <laughs> and everything else like that and, and, I, it, it, and I make the people laugh laughter is the greatest healer in, in everything and Dick have you found as a cancer survivor that attitude does play an important role in, in your recovery what you just said is the wisest thing. Yes, that attitude. You know, my wife said to one of the doctors, realize the pills you want my, my husband to take uh, cause pancreatic cancer? And his answer was, well, at his age, we're, we're not worried about that. Oh, my God. Yeah, we want to give it a big dose. <sighs> so, you know, there are things out there you can do and watch what you put in your body to eat and a mental attitude and make other people happy. Forget about, that makes you forget about your pain. My wife has MS, had it since she was 14. Mm. And she cries herself to sleep at night every night. She has fibromyalgia throughout her body and she will not take any type of pain pill because we don't believe in that because it'll kill you. And so I massage her because I got healing hands and I massage her every single night. And she said, but, she gets up at 5 in the morning because of the pain, and she keeps on going. Makes her body keep on moving. She's on the computer. She's booking me. She's promoting me all over the world with the AP release. Uh, she keeps herself busy, and she cooks, and like a guardian angel that's been sent to me. And, you know, you know, people say, what's love? But how do you know when you're in love? Well, let me tell you something. I never, and, and this is, this is, this is fact. I never loved anybody because they never loved me. They were just along for the ride. I'm talking about the people who come and try to do all these things. So what happened was, through love, when Lana came into my life, she's very religious, and we believe in certain things. And she said, I'm going to tell you this, and I tell everybody when they start getting boyfriends and girlfriends and get all this saturation stuff going on, the truth is this. When somebody does something for you, Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, 24 hours a day in dedication, and they give themselves to you without asking anything or in return except your feelings back of thanks. You have to respect that person mm -hmm. because the the other word I can't think of it because the diabetes is stopping me, but it'll come back later. But the dedication that one gives somebody else, nonstop. I mean nonstop. She walks by me and rubs my forehead for a temperature, rubs my feet because she knows what the disease does. She does cooks around the clock to make sure I'm having this and that. And yet she's dealing with her own pain. Yeah. And never complains that says honey I heard and I'll rub her well say something that you got to respect of an individual and that respect means true love yeah unconditional that's the word unconditional when somebody is so unconditional to you around the clock every moment she never lets me out of her sight mm -hmm. and I'm going to fall he tells the roadies, you get up there by the, because they used to carry me on stage. 
Hey, I, I couldn't walk on stage. They'd oh put me gosh. in a chair and I'd be playing. Mm. I couldn't even sit in a car. I couldn't get out of a car. The pain was so horrific. And they would lift me out of the car, put me in a wheelchair, and put me on the stage so that I could perform. The, the, now I'm running around like a madman up there, you know. <laughs> but the thing lies is I'm still doing it. Yeah. And Dick, you just, are, are you sure? Are you sure, Dick, that Lana's just not telling you she has MS so she can get those free massages? <laughs> <laughs> oh, I love it. <laughs> I love it. I'm going to tell her that. <laughs> Uh, yeah, she's been a sweetheart, boy, with with setting up this interview too. It started number one. Well, it was two things, two elements. One was talk about how I started the sound. The, the sound came from. Gene Cooper go into the jungles and get his rhythms from the Watusis, from the natives, on how they did their fair dance, their war dance, their breeding dance, all these things. The rhythms mm. created natural rhythm where they would count on the one. And it's so funny that conductors of orchestrations, orchestras, symphonic orchestras. In fact, I got to conduct one to Mizzaloo. They were all on the one. One, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four. And you'll see a conductor standing on his podium with a baton going one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four. All right. Now, the drummer, when he's drumming, they want to get fancy and they want to change things around. So they'll go like this. They'll go, um, and then they'll go rest, and then they'll do the turnaround. One, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, one. Well, the person that's counting with them, they don't hear the beat when the rest is because the drummer wanted to be funny and not put it on the one. So it should sound like this. Put up a percent and dot it and then dot two, dot it and then dot three, dot it and then dot a ticket, 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 That's the turnaround. Then done fast. You, mm. I, we learned the tongue it. And so the, the thing is, Gene Cooper, he did that because played the rhythms that people could understand, feel, and count with their body and tap their foot. But then you had other people like uh, Buddy Rich was like an Einstein on drums because he wanted to learn every kind of a rhythm that he could possibly learn and play it and every part of the drums that he could do and everything else like that. But he was doing all this for only the musicians that could understand him, the jazz musicians. So they had jam, jazz uh, jam sessions. And when they had a drum off with Louis Belson, Gene Krupa, Buddy Rich, they had about 10 drummers playing and when Gene Cooper finished he went over to Buddy Rich and said Buddy I'd give anything to play what you can play and Buddy Rich said <laughs> I, I won't say it but F you he said did you see how many people standing around me and how many people standing around you there were musicians standing around Buddy Rich one quarter of the audience and there was Hundreds standing around in Koopa. Mm. Right? Because he was playing the rhythms that the Watusis and all the tribes, the indigenous tribes, and I have been with them, and in Australia, and uh, uh, they, they brought the Aborigine. They gave me stick paintings and, and, uh, and brought their children to me when I played because I did a song for them. I had a, a, a didgeridoo. And so they came to see me. They have the same rhythm. One, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four. So when I teach people, I train them on that one, two, three, four. So, and then I learn to pick it. I go, tick it, tick And then it goes like, for instance, in a Shaolin temple, they never allow you to touch the skin of a drum for years until you can actually tongue 
what you're going to play with your hands. Mm. And when you go one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, one, like that, you got to go ticka 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 And then when you go ticka 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 like that. Oh, my that's gosh. In your, that's imprinted in your brain. So I took that, that sound that Gene Cooper learned, and I put it into a pick, and I went ticka 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 So when I go, if I'm playing surfing, I'll go... And that's what you hear in Mizzaloo. Mm -hmm. Mizzaloo, they called it a Greek folk song. But I got news for you. An Arabic song. And, in fact, the word Mizzaloo means the Egyptian. And okay. I always thought it was Greek. Isn't that something? Yeah. That's what everybody says. But then why is the title an Arabic title? Why is it an Arabic love song? Wayno Habibi, Wayno Habibi, Achfein. Where are you, my sweetheart, my sweetheart? It's all in Arabic. And it was, mm. play, and I, my uncle played it on a uh, oud, O U D instrument, and with a chicken quill. What, 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 what is that, Dick? An, an oud? Is it a drum or a? A oud is a, a stringed instrument they oh. played way back in the historical times also. Mm -hmm. it, it has a, a, a bulbous, uh, well, you can look it up in the computer, oud, yeah. O-U-D, and it'll show you a picture of it. It's a stringed instrument. And uh, also they played it on an Arabic drum, uh, the, the beat, called a didabaki. And they go boom, ba boom, boom, ba. And the song was done slowly as it was a, uh, a love song it goes and then the belly dancers would come out and do all the Arabic belly dancing and do all of that stuff so how it came to me playing it the way I do when I started playing it at the rendezvous ballroom in Balboa, California, had about 17 surfers that just came to see me, and this was a building that every big band in the world played there. And from there, they would take the boat and go over to Catalina, an island about 20 miles off the coast, and play over at the casino ballroom, which I reopened when it was closed. But everybody, Harry James, Guy Lombardo, Gene Krupa, they all played at this ballroom that covered a whole city block and it held 4,000 people. And I reopened that because they closed it when Stan Kenton tried to bring back jazz and it failed. And they were just going to just burn it down. And the, the people that owned it, they just closed it. And I talked them into letting me reopen it with my dad. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, and we, and the guys I was surfing with, that I'm going to be playing there. And this is really funny because the uh, states of the cities could not allow people to congregate to rock and roll at that time, 1955 oh. or. And they said it was, they called the music on the guitar devil music, evil music. So when they had graduations, they would go and rent the ballroom and they would have horn bands, strictly horn bands, no stringed instruments. And so that was evil. So I talked with my dad and, my, and I, we went to the city uh, uh, parent teachers association, fire department, the police department, all uh, the, the council members, and we met during nighttime because they didn't want anybody to know what we were meeting about. And then I said, would you rather have the kids in one big building where you could control them, or would you rather have them out in the street drinking tea bird? And tea bird was the <laughs> cheap point. wine. Good the bird. So they said, well, oh, yeah. One. And then they said, well, they got to wear ties. <laughs> well, who ever heard of a surfer wearing a tie? Right. So my dad bought a box of ties to oblige their wishes and he gave and, and I told the, the surface but we didn't have money I just told the surface I was there they came down the opening night 17 surface in a ballroom that held 4,000 my dad handed them 
eyes, and they were in bare feet, or shorts rather, and I started to play, and then the word got out, and within like two and a half weeks, we had 4,000 people that it's, we had to make more fire exits. Uh, so oh my God. It was so full. And we are embedded in over 200 save the animals from the, the Mustang horses that are being slaughtered and, and, and by the thousands. And that we get all the letters from every one of these uh, organizations that we support. And, and from the rhinos, from the elephants, from everything that is being completely annihilated, from the people who are, you know, I don't know how, no, know how anybody could kill anything. You know, I mean, it, uh, like that. They're shooting them right from the helicopters because horse meat is a delicacy in Europe. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's unbelievable what they're doing, and and uh, and we we get firsthand everything because we're we're supporting members. Mm -hmm. so, uh, we we belong to over two hundred of them, and I, I took care of and I had animals over forty five different species that I I raised, took care of. 35 years, lions, tigers, apes, everything. You name it, I've had them. And, and I had them running, running almost like free, not in a, a confined cage. I mean, I used to sleep with my lion in bed. I don't, wouldn't tell anybody to do this because you gotta know what you're doing, otherwise they'll, they'll eat you just playing with you. Mm -hmm. but, because they're wild animals. But the thing lies is I was preserving them from the poachers, killing them. Yeah. And so they live their happy lives. I mean, I've made, you know, uh, all the creatures that are out here in the desert where we live, they're dying left and right from the pollution that is killing them from the animals that they eat, mm. from the creatures. And I, I, just, I just made a, a huge den uh, the coyotes, my, they call my wife every night. They live on the ranch, and they bring their babies to her, mm. and and things like that. I mean, but then we go out and we see dead ones all over the place. Mm -hmm. it, it, they, they don't, they they can't get what they need to, to yeah. eat. Yeah. Yeah, Dick. Dick, I read somewhere where you, uh, when you play now, you think more of animals than the feeling you had originally got from surfing. Is that an accurate uh, description of when you're playing? When I was raising all my animals, I I, I come home, uh, my lion would go, ah! oh, cry to me, a big elephant I had would scream to me because when I would feed it, I would shove her the food in my hand down her down her mouth and rub her tongue and feeding her. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and she would wow to be like that, like a pterodactyl. Uh, my African lion, Elsa, he'd go like that at 5.30 every day because she was telling me she wanted to eat. So I'd go in there with about 20 pounds of chicken mix, and, uh, and, and I'd sit down and I'd feed them by hand. Uh, I, I mixed King Cooper's fat drumming sound because I wanted that thick, thick sound and <clears throat> with an edge on it. And I mixed it with the screaming of my elephants, my hawks, my eagles, my lions, my tigers. And every one of those things, I see a picture of them when I go, wow, way up and down like that. Mm -hmm. And then I mixed it with the roar also and the rumble of the ocean. So what happened was because I was surfing, I was playing my guitar, the surfers called me king of the surf guitar. And that's how that started. I was playing Hank Williams songs. I love the country. Always wanted to be a cowboy singer. And that's another story. Was he your hero, Dick, Hank Williams? I taught his, 
I trained, I, I gave instruction to his daughter, Jet Williams, for to perform on stage. Oh, boy. He came to me at one of the big conventions where we were at and said, Dick, I, I'm so scared to death. I don't know how to address an audience. I don't know what to do. I panic every time I get on the audience, into the audience. I told her what to do. And, and I said, you, how to look at them. That's another story. And I, and, and a year later, came back to me at another convention in tears and hugged me and, and her and her husband and, uh, they live in this big, huge type of houseboat up in the lake, Great Lakes, and it, it worked. It worked. It worked. <laughs> <laughs> so Hank Williams was my uh, big hero when it came to singing. And so I, I went and uh, got me. Uh, uh, here I'm delving. I'm going off the track, but that's quite all right. Please, please do. You no, know, I went to a. Uh, I was reading a Superman magazine when I was a child, and I saw a horse, a guy, a cowboy on a horse on the back cover of Superman magazine with a lariat, burying the horse, and it said, sell so many jars of Noxzema skin cream, and we'll send you this ukulele. And it was, so I went out in the snow and <laughs> back in Quincy, which is only nine miles from Boston where I live, and banging on the doors at night and say, buy my Noxzema skin cream. Dickie, Dickie, you're supposed to be in bed. You're going to school tomorrow. You know, stuff like that. <laughs> and I sold enough jars of Noxzema skin cream, I could have bought a car, for crying out loud. <laughs> and, and then what happened was, I had to wait about three months. I finally got my ukulele. In fact, if you get one of the History of Ukulele books, you'll see my picture in the side front cover with a Dora on holding my ukulele. <laughs> and, uh, <clears throat> but... When I got it, I was so mortified because the pegs would fall out of the holes <laughs> that you would turn, <laughs> tighten up the strings. It was made out of like a pressed cardboard. And I mean, I just I smashed that thing and threw it away in the garbage can. I got my red wagon, red rider wagon, <laughs> put all my uh, Pepsi bottles in it and took it up to the store and I got $5 for five dollars and ninety five cents a plastic ukulele that was cream on top and brown on the body and screws holding the tuning pegs in. So I picked that up and I got a book, but the book didn't say put it the other way, stupid, you're left handed. <laughs> oh oh and, yeah, and that's I right, you're left handed. Yeah. Couldn't figure out why my fingers wouldn't go where the it was telling me to go. Because mm. it wasn't made for that. So I would take it home force my fingers to make this three chords and and I used to tape my fingers going to sleep at night saying that a little godmother would come and keep my fingers on the notes so that I could play them without <laughs> rattle or something And but anyway I learned to do that and I played all the Hank Williams songs and all that kind of stuff but when I picked up my trumpet I played like Harry James copying Harry James and Louis Armstrong so, you know, that was the thing that I did, and playing on drums, first instrument, I was playing with knives on my mother's sugar cans and flower cans, my dad's big band records, mm. and he used to whack me off the back of the head and say, you're scratching your mother's flower pans for crying out loud again. <laughs> so, <laughs> that's how that all started, but my dad would bring home big band albums, so I would pick up different instruments, learn to play them, the trumpet. You you're self-taught, aren't you, Dick? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I can't, I can't read. I can't. I'm self-taught in everything that I do. Well, I play the sax, the trumpet. Incredible, incredible. Uh, that was my favorite because I used to play it to my mother all the time. God bless her. Mm. But I took that picking style and one kid, and so I would take Hank Williams songs and I would jazz them up, and I'd go dum, instead of going ding, dick, ding, ding, dick, I go ding, get the down, the dick, get the down, rockabilly. As the hillbilly music, is, there's a difference between Western and, and uh, country music. What is the difference? The difference is Western music are songs about places. Every land, lots of land under starry skies above, don't fence me in. Songs like that about <laughs> the land. The hillbilly music are songs about people. Why'd you leave me today? Stomp my, my heart, my sucker. You stomped that sucker flat and left me all alone. <laughs> gotcha. Yeah, okay. Got Everybody you. Everybody's in their beer because their mates have left them. Mm-hmm. And that is, that's the hillbilly music. That's the ones that 
everybody can they they relate to. Yes, absolutely. Like sure. Sinatra and Roy Rogers and all those people saying Western music, all about the, see them tumbling down the tumble tumbleweeds, all those country songs. Because I'm a romantic, I've always been that. I love th- th- those songs about, you know, why did you leave me today? Today I started loving you again and stuff like that. Mm-hmm. I, I thought about Mizzaloo. So I started doing it slow. Us, I sat there with my uncles and I played the Dinner Bucky drums. I watched them play it. And so I started playing it on the guitar. But I goes, oh wow, like this, because it's too slow. Um, the gun, the dum, 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 that kind of a beat. I goes, oh man, what am I going to do? I goes, I know what. Do it like Gene Krupa. And I went, da, 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 and like mm. the way you hear it today. And <laughs> that's how that came to be. Now, Gene Krupa was the reason of my attack on the instruments. When I met Leo Fender, he was the Einstein of guitars. He said, play it and tell me what you think and you know, I couldn't play it as a person a real musician could play it and he had a man w- working for him and his name was uh, uh, Freddy Tav- uh, Tavares he played the Hawaiian steel guitar for Harry Owens who played all those beautiful Hawaiians who wrote the most beautiful Hawaiian songs mm-hmm. in fact I sent a letter to my dad and wanted me to record one of his beautiful Hawaiian songs your dad James, by the way, you've mentioned him a few times. Your dad James, right? Yeah, yeah. And 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 so my dad watched out for me like like the Sean you know. <laughs> he, yeah, <laughs> yeah. So uh, he wouldn't let me hang with anybody uh, when it was over. You, I had to come right straight home back home, didn't get a bed and stuff like that. But he was very strict with me. But I I applaud him for that because it gave me the strength. And all the people that wanted me to do drugs and do everything, and I would, I would just tell them right to their face, and I'd fire them. Uh, yeah, Dick. How, uh, just to, to interrupt for a second. How, my goodness, I give you. You're such an inspiration. How did you resist not doing, falling into that drugs and alcohol? I mean, Other, because when I was a child, I, I, uh, my mentality is created by one thing. Some people have a dream they want to be somebody. And some people have a dream that they want to say to learn to build a house. And some people have these dreams. I had no dreams. What I did was when I was in 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 uh, elementary school, I was drawing pictures of rockets out of my head and stuff like that. And then what happened was I, I just would walk around and see things. I wanted to see what made it work, whether it was electronics, whether it was building a, a house, whether it was doing any of these things. Now, how that came to be, in my youth, I met uh, some martial art instructors. So I started studying in the martial arts, all forms, all styles, since I was young, very young. I learned that my body is my temple. Don't desecrate your temple, your body. Don't go messing it up. You don't need to go to a building to pray. In the martial arts, I learned respect, and it was beaten to you. In Japan, there were people who would lay naked in the snow outside of a dojo, prove that they're worthy. I have met these people. I have been trained by these people. Japan style, Okinawan style, the tempo from Hawaii, from Ed Parker. And this gave me this foundation because when I was very, very young, I had to cook the food for my mom and daddy when they were working. I used to work for five cents an hour. Bakery, I... yeah, big bakery. I used to dig and fill a 90-pound sack of clams and sell them one dollar. I used to set up pins in the bowling alley by hand, and my my allowance a week for get a two story house that for doing all the washing the floors and 
sewing and the ironing that I had to do, all these different things to make the house right and then cook the meatloaf for my mom and daddy, I would get 50 cents into the week. A week. And one time, I'll forget, father's father, that he heard me ask my mother I wanted to go to the movies. And when I finished, did all the cleaning. So my mom and dad came home, Mom, can I have my, can I have my 50 cents? Can I have my 50 cents? I <laughs> he went, and he looked at me, and he slapped me right across the face. Wow. But don't you ever ask your mother for Masari. But he didn't realize that I earned that mm -hmm. for a whole week's work. Sure. So he wanted to make sure that I, I worked for everything that I've done. I had never, nothing ever given to me. So when I asked one of my masters, I said, Master, why can't I be unbeatable? I mean, I did bow and arrow shooting. I did all kinds of stuff. I've been flying planes. I've been, why can't I be the best? I fought in tournaments, everything. And I say, why can't I be the unbeatable? I said, you can, grasshopper. And he said, <laughs> let me ask you one question. Rather be a jack of all trades, master of none, or would you rather be master of one? And if you are master of one, it would be awfully dull at a gathering, wouldn't you? If I was building a table, I would never bend a nail, take, and then cover it with a piece of molding so the buyer could not see it because I knew it was there. So I would unbend it, take it out. My dad used to say, Jesus, I had, I had to hire you. I had to pay. I, I'd go broke paying you by the, <laughs> by the hour. <laughs> by the hour, <laughs> taking out that nail. And, and this word character just rang a bell. A, a master told me, oh, a monk. I had been with monks. I had my gong yell signed by a dozen monks. And they, I learned their way of life. And they once told me, pertaining to people who walk the earth, we call them earth people. And this is the saying, thoughts become words. Words, actions. Actions become your habits. Think about that. And so, and we have another one. Experience is to know. To know is to understand. To understand is to tolerate. So it took me 18 years to understand that and another 18 years to apply it. Buddha used to say, how can you get mad at an idiot? They know no better. So you see, do not become, allow yourself to become involved in something that, it, uh, in something that destroys all relationships, whether it's male and female, whether it's business partners or what. How many times do you get an argument? I says, I didn't mean it that way. Oh, yes, you did. That's the way it, uh, it came to me. Mm -hmm. They're going, well, you know what? If we go to court and you get a jury of 12 people, they're going to say that you're wrong. No, you're not. And they go into a big fight. And the word perceivability. One perceives things. So remember when I said thoughts become words? Yes. Mm -hmm. Words become actions. Well, that's where that fits into, perceivability. Mm -hmm. mm. It's a destructive force. So it's best not open your mouth and not let them know how much you don't know. Mm -hmm. And I used to tell kids, don't speak because they'll fear you. They don't know what you know. They don't know what you don't know. Open your mouth. They will know what you don't know, and they'll be on you like a used car salesman. Everybody has intelligence. Monkeys have intelligence. They'll take a ladder and climb a tree and get a banana so they don't have to climb the tree on their own. Mm -hmm. I know this. I raised them. But... Intelligence becomes your enemy. Why? Because you come up with so many intelligent ideas, you decide you want to go down these roads, and you find out you're going to get screwed, boot, and tattooed because you've made a wrong decision. 
So now, what controls? What controls intelligence? What word? Wisdom. And where do you get wisdom? Making all the mistakes throughout your life, telling yourself never to go back down that road again. So you are now wise, like a wise old owl. That's how you learn. And I'd rather speak to somebody 80 years of age, 30 minutes, have them tell me they have witnessed their life but not to go and repeat, making all the wrong moves and and recognize them. Now, some people, unfortunately, they don't want to learn. They don't learn. Well, they'll, they'll be making the same mistakes all their life until they die. Mm-hmm. And, and that's that. So anyway, so anyway, because I don't want people to assume what I mean. They'll say, what you do yesterday? And one guy goes, oh, I went to the store. Well, how mundane is that? Uh-huh. But if you want to tell them what really happened, yeah, I went to the store, I got a flat tire, and I asked this guy to help me fix the tire, and he robbed me, and he took all my money and left me. And so, you know, yep. that's what he did. So tell him what he did, you know, mm-hmm. see what I mean? Somebody <laughs> asked the other guy, did you interview uh, Joe? Yeah, he went to the store. <laughs> right. Oh, Man. I mean, how are you going to learn anything else? You're going to learn this. Be careful who you ask to go help you change a tire. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. There's, a, there's a bit of wisdom. I used to write a, a two-page column, a Music Confidential, a beautiful, glossy magazine. I used to talk about fandom. Everything I would experience going on tour, going on a road, that I could tell all these young musicians of how they're being blue and tattooed. They, they, and they shouldn't allow that to happen with a little bit of penicillin without sounding like a preacher. I, instead of saying, you know, you shouldn't do this and shouldn't drink when you do this and shouldn't do that, I just said, ah, this is what I saw and I spoke to them and they told me. So anyway, I started playing like that back and uh, and I wanted it to sound like the rhythm of Gene Cooper. <clears throat> and then I wanted my sound to sound like Gene Cooper's drums. But those days, they didn't have output transformers. That would produce a loud sound. There were only about 10, 15 watts, and the transformers would produce the sound. So I said to Leo, Leo, I got to get it bigger and bigger. I got to get a big, fat sound. I even, instead of uh, using guitar strings that were 6, 7, 8, 9, 10 gauge, my strings started at 16 gauge, 18 gauge, 20 gauge, 39 wound 49 wound and 60 gauge strings wound if uh, if people called them uh, critics called them bridge cables Mm -hmm. and they turned around and uh, and that thickness is what combined but we had to design a output transformer that's why Leo was saying why do you have to play so loud why do you got to play so loud I blew up over 50 of his amplifiers (laughs) Uh, you know, Jack, I'll, I'll tell you, if you go to a Dictale show, listeners, bring earphones, uh, earplugs, because you do, boy, oh, boy, you just, you just rip it up, Dick. I make your ears bleed. Yeah. <laughs> but, in a good way, in a good way. <laughs> yeah. But I want that, well, that's why I change. I go from one type of song to another type of song. But I, I wanted the thickness. And so Leo, uh, Freddie Tavares, was the man who put, put uh, who tested out the uh, the, tele, the Telecaster uh, guitar. Mm-hmm. And he turns around, let me push a button here. Okay. Um, I did the Telecaster, and then Leo wanted me to, to work on the Stratocaster. So that's what I was doing. And, and then what happened was, uh, Freddie said, let's go see Dick in concert. I'd be able to answer some of your questions why he plays like he's playing, he's saying, blowing up your amplifiers. 
We brought Leo and we had 4,000 people in the ballroom that night. <clears throat> Leo stood there and he said, now I know what Dick is trying to tell me, back to the drawing board. Mm -hmm. And he called me up at about 3 in the morning and he said, I got it, I got it, Dick, you got to come down, I got it, I got it. Created the first 85 watt output transformer that peaked 100 watts with the gas in the tubes we used, the glass vacuum tubes, 5881 tubes, they, they were called. Mm -hmm. and, and that was like going from a little VW to a t into a Testarossa. <laughs> and <laughs> then we needed a speaker that could handle it. Because I had fried every one of his little old Jensen speakers. <laughs> and, you know, and I tell kids, kids will come up to me and say, Oh, I got this one amp, I got four 12s in it, you know. <clears throat> and, I'm, and I tell them, listen, it has 30 12s in it, but a 12 will never sound any different a 15-inch speaker. And so we went to JBL Lansing, and we and Leo said, I want a 15-inch speaker. I'm going to get about a 11-pound magnet on the back. I wanted an aluminum dust cover in the front cone so that I could hear the click of the pick when you turned up the treble. And they started laughing. Well, what are you going to do, put it on a tugboat? <laughs> and Leo just looked at him very quietly. He, he was just like an Einstein. Built a three-foot-high cabinet, two feet wide, 12 inches deep. We didn't put a porthole sound in it. We just packed it full of fiberglass packing. We wanted the speaker to go in and out, in and out, in and out. That was called, and plug it into the amplifier, and the amp was called a showman. Aimed at a showman because he used to call me a showman. He said, you're such a showman, you mm -hmm. leap up. Then <clears throat> the color changed because we didn't have, our, as I was blowing up the amps, we didn't have uh, uh, any more covering, and there was a brown covering, and then he found some cream to that covering, and he covered that amplifier with it. He said, here, use this, but don't let anybody see it because it's very impractical. They're going to get coffee stains on it. They're going to put the cigarette butts on it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> he, he said, just hide it behind the speaker. And I said, oh, Leo, but I love it. Oh, I love it. I love the color. Oh, gosh. <laughs> and then a week later, he says, come here. Calls me in, and this whole little assembly line was all covered with cream Tolex, uh -huh. as you see, <clears throat> of the Fender amplifiers and speakers. And then when I plugged in my guitar, my Strat, that Showman amplifier with the single 15 in it, but that 85-watt output transformer peaking 100 watts, <clears throat> it was just like... It was like I, the walls started coming down, mm -hmm. <laughs> turned up the volume. And I said, Leo, I want to put two speakers in it. He goes, what? Oh, my God. He says, you're going to have to, i got to rewire re the transformer. i got to rebuild the transformer. i got to build a 100-watt uh, hundred watt transformer, peaking 180 watts. <laughs> and that's what he did. Mm. He built that. That's what they call them, the big deal transformers. So Leo Fender created that stuff for me, and with me, you know, experimenting it. And he gave me the last seven before he passed away. And and I'm still playing through the original Transformers in the 50s. In yep. fact, Hendrix, I taught Jimmy. Uh, I found Jimmy when he was playing bass for Little Richard in the bar in Pasadena to 30 people. He wasn't even Jimmy Hendrix then. And, and uh, his drummer, who opened for me, uh, Buddy Miles, He'd tell the audience, he'd go, uh, uh, pardon my French, Jimmy would say, I got my best, I don't know for, uh, but anyway, I'm going to say yeah. it. No, Jimmy you can't, say, absolutely I got can. my best from Dick Dale. You know, <laughs> <laughs> every, he used to say that every day. <clears throat> but it was kind of really neat. And uh, that that sound was the slides uh, on, on uh, my animals. And then for my animals, as I was surfing, when I got caught in a tube, and I'd been eaten and eaten, chewed up, and spit out more than once, I've been left for dead on the beach at least a, half a dozen times. Especially when I I was the first guy to take a surfboard and surf the wedge, Balboa, California, and then broke it in half. Mm. And uh, that was a ten footer. And, and when I did that, it was like it was like that's when pe people's ears bled. Ha, 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 ha.
<laughs> One time I took six of those amplifiers and I wired them all together, all the speakers. And when I when I hit that 60 gauge string, it was at the Pasadena Civic Auditorium, and my feet l- were lifted off the ground. <laughs> <laughs> and I I said, all right, that's too heavy for me. <laughs> they call me louder than Motorhead. Uh, I, well, you're the father of heavy metal, Dick. Yeah, well, so, you know, the, the, that's what they got me on the cover in the Spain on the heavy metal magazines. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and that's what they call me. Who did the birds? Yeah, big animal activist. Yeah, she. They brought her to me, and because they wanted her to work with my my uh, lion Elsa, and uh, and uh, when she was doing, uh, she had done Born Free and then Living Free, and uh, they wanted to take Elsa. And she w- she was right along with Elsa so well, and then I had one of my big big hawks that I, w- I wanted her to feel what it was like to hold a big hawk, you know, and fly and have it fly to her. Mm-hmm. And I didn't realize that, that at that time her manager was saying, oh, no, 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 no. Well, I didn't know that he'd gone to a resting place just after making the pictures of the birds. But you know what? She was a brave woman, and she didn't let me know about it. But I knew she was stiff and everything, and I put mm-hmm. a gauntlet on her. <clears throat> now I'm going to take this big, beautiful red tail as a female, and I said, I'm going to go down. I had two and a half acres going down. So I went down and told her to hold this chicken neck in her hand, let the bird loose, the whistle to it like, you know, went up in the air and swooped down to the ground where the feathers touched the ground because they, they'll pull up and, and break and, uh, and bam, landed right on our hand. And mm. That was the first time he has been near a bird, any kind of a bird. And she did it beautifully yeah. and he was so surprised. A, a, a big congressman, I believe. He was the one. It's in my web page. If you go to my personal page uh, and scroll all the way down to the middle of it, you'll see him speaking to the members of Congress, the White House. And it was like a letter he sent me. But he said that I want Dick Dale to be voted into the, into uh, for all time Congressional Hall of Records, and he is the king of the surf guitar. That is in my web page, and also. Right now, I am orbiting the moon and I'm orbiting Mars. And the guys from NASA come to see me. And when the, the rocket went off being launched, I was there playing my guitar. <laughs> on a beat. Wow. Oh, my goodness. And I was going <laughs> like that as it was lifting off. Uh-huh. <laughs> they went and put a computer chip with Dick D- the name Dick Dale and a serial number, and on the one that is orbiting uh, the moon and one that's orbiting Mars. And they sent me the big poster with all the signatures on it, also the the uh, certificate of the serial number that is on the chip that is orbiting on it. Wow. That's something. Could I impose upon you to come back then and, and, and talk more? Well, yeah, you can talk with me. Okay. Well, when, when you come back with, with, in April, when you, when you start your, your southern tour in April, can you come back on the show and we'll talk some more? Yeah, of course. Yeah, go ahead and do it. Uh, the, the, the main thing is is that a lot of times people twist, uh, interviewers twist things around. Mm. And and uh, they say, oh, he claims, he claims this. but But you have... A demeanor about you, like the guys, the guys that I ran with. Oh, but because you're on the East Coast, like I can talk to a person and they can tell me one sentence, and your mind, I know, is open enough.
when you meet her, she'll, she'll make you melt because she wanted to be a nun in the beginning. And, the, well, the lady who became a nun, who is that movie star from the Beach Party days. She was in one of the Elvis movies as well, wasn't she? Right, yeah. She yeah, was yeah. A very dear friend of Lana. She would write to Lana every day. Lana writes to Doris Day. She started writing since she was five years old, and Doris writes to her all the time. And Lana calls her Dodo. Uh, Doris wanted her to come and be with her and take care of her. Well, I, I can tell from Lana's emails to me, Dick, that she is just the, the sweetest thing around. Oh, yeah. yeah and, mean, well, and you know what? You're, I'm, I'm sure you're sweet to her as well. Well, that's what it's all about. We, we are inseparable. Yeah. Oh, and, and that's what it is. She used to sit in Johnny Cash's lap. <laughs> Johnny would come to Florida where she was. Lana did over 100 plays. Gone with the Wind, Joan of Arc, all those things. And she worked with all of these people, but she never got married, never had a boyfriend. She told everybody she was going to be with saving herself for Dick Dale. And I'll end it with this. This year, I, she'll kill me if I tell you. When she was, <laughs> when she was, she's Cherokee. Her great grandma was full blooded Cherokee. But two years old, her father was killed, burial tax, and she never knew him. Right? Oh, mm hmm. He was taking care of her mother stirring soup, standing on a box on a chair. They were very poor, and the mother gave her an album given to the mother by the mother's brother, and it was a picture of a tiger, Big Dale. The album was called Tiger's Loose. Mm. And it had the tiger's eye looking straight out. Anna loved the animal so much that she looked at the tiger's eye, and she goes, Mommy, look at his eye. Then she looked into my eyes, and she goes, Mommy, his eyes said, Mommy, one day I'm going to be with him the rest of my life. What an amazing story. Wow. They want to make a movie out of it. Yeah, and well. They've turned them down, but let me, I'll finish with this. Mm -hmm. She never, ever, ever tried to contact me because at the time I was married to a horrific marriage. And, mm -hmm. but the point lies is she respected that. That's when, and she became friends with the girl who became the nun. Mm-hmm. Wanted Lana to come to the monastery up on the east coast there, and the whole shebang. And he was always telling people, Orson Welles, when he saved her life, she saved his life. And he wanted her to go to Hollywood with her because she was so smart. And she said, "No, I'm saving myself for Dick Dale." And then she, her mother, told her to email me, and she did. Then I come home and we discovered Skype and she could see me how I was shaking every time I had to go to the bathroom. I've loved you since I was two. Mm. Then my mother intervened, made her take a dollar, go to a scratch off because we had no money. I had all my money was gone from the divorces. Yeah. All I had was my ranch and she won over five hundred dollars on a scratch off. Uh. And we've never been out of each other's sight. What a beautiful, beautiful story. Yeah. And it's deeper and deeper and deeper than that. So we've mm -hmm. about five different things wanting to do a movie, and but we're just saying no at this point right now because we're trying to stay alive. Well, Dick, I... I I have to tell you what a thrill and an honor it's been to, to speak with you. It's, it's a dream come true. I've been, uh, uh, I've been a lifetime Dick Dale fan, and for me to have the opportunity to speak with you like this... Um, it's been a pleasure, really. Uh, so where, are you, where are you at now? I'm in Fort Lee, New Jersey. Anna does all the booking now. She yeah, won't I, I think she mentioned August, August of 2015. You'll be in the Northeast. Yeah, yeah okay. Well, I better... So I'll find you for sure. <laughs> Uh, keep staying alive. That's all. Well, <laughs> you better is right. All right, buddy. We love you, Dick. All right, thank you so very much. It's I been bless a pleasure. You and good health to you. And same to you. Thank you, sir.